This call is being recorded. Hey everyone, it's uh, David Barnett, and I got another caller on the line for our Holiday Chat 2018 series. This time, we're talking with Jay in Central Florida. Um, Jay, why don't you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your situation, uh, and then we can see what you want to talk about today. Hey, David. Yes, um, I appreciate you taking the call. I am specifically looking for ideas into either creating a business, which could be not necessarily a good fit for me, but more importantly, the reason for the entire call is to possibly purchasing a business. And here is the quick and dirty with me, which is a might be a little unusual uh, for some listeners. I'm uh, mid 40 single, no kids, no debt. Uh, a, a good six-figure paying job, very low six figures, uh, under 150000 a year, no debt, don't own a home, don't have um, much of anything. I live like a college student. I invest everything. I would rather suffer now and, and enjoy later. And I get paid full-time money for part-time work, and I have a, a lot of free time. And I just um, want to explore with you some ideas on businesses, um, just getting some ideas and then possibly something in the future where I can have a non-emotional attachment to looking over a business and somebody like yourself saying, hey, these are the numbers, this is no good. Or these are the numbers, this is great, along with some assistance. So I'm basically, David, I'm just want to explore this with you. Sure. Now, <clears throat> you're you're right in that a lot of the people I talk to are not in your position. Um, now, you mentioned starting or buying a business, and you mentioned the kind of hours that you work. Tell me what you do when you're not at work. Anything I want. So is that binging on Netflix or are you, are you doing sports, hiking, traveling? I'm pretty much, I take calls. Most of my, the, I work for someone and I basically get called in. I'm in the, the medical field. When there's a problem, I do things online. I do the majority of what I can do on the phone. I, I'm, I literally, when I say that, it's as bold as I can be. I can do anything I want to do and without any oversight. As long as the, his business that my employer is running smoothly, I can do anything I want to do, which again is extremely rare. Anyone listening would say, wow, I wish I could have that job. It's a, it's a dream job and I love it. So I want to do something starting on the side and I know it would take time, but uh, eventually get out of it, which would be a dumb idea. But uh, for the meantime, do this and get something started on the side that explore that wouldn't break the bank or mm. stress me out, but I'm willing to take a risk. So if you bought or started a business and you kept your job, I guess my other question would be, it, it sounds like you're kind of on call, like maybe an event happens and then you get called into some to uh, to work. Is that kind of how it works? Correct. Typically, that happens during the day, so I have to be flexible in my time. But as long as mm -hmm. I'm close to a laptop, I would say 80, 90 percent of the time, I can do whatever I want to do. I could be, I could be surfing at the beach. I could be watching Netflix. I could be hanging out at the pool. It, but I, my mind doesn't work that way. Um, and something you mentioned is um, the Myers Briggs um, outlook. Um, one of your great podcasts and um i'm an istj and so if you look that up it's very diligent very focused mm -hmm. um likes to think before doing so that's kind of uh, where my mindset is is i have time to do this is i istj is that what you said yes is that the uh i, I think some people describe that kind of as the scientist right Yes, very focused, um, explores first, takes action later. 
Mm -hmm. um, very cautious, but uh, systems oriented. You've said that many times in your podcast about systems. Um, you've said quite a few things in the past year and a half that I've found you that resonate for me, and it's the smallest little things you've said. And the Myers Brig was one, like not many people mm -hmm. in business know about that or go by it. Uh, working backwards from your ultimate goal, let's work backwards. That was uh, another one. Pain today, pleasure in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your motivation? Um, not being the technician, being the owner. So these are things that I think you and I have in common. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about some of the other things you did for work before you got into your present line? Because um, I want to explore a little bit about your experience and some of the, you know, some of the industries you may have worked in. And, and I'm curious to know a little bit about what things you enjoyed and what things you didn't. Previously, it was a, it was in a, in a diff, it was in healthcare, but I was my, I was an entrepreneur. Uh, it didn't go very well um, in that industry. It's a very tough industry I was in, and it it scared it scared me to death. Mm -hmm. um, I I wasn't prepared. Um, I didn't know how much work it took. So now I'm get I get a nice, relatively fat paycheck. 401k match bonuses everything and I'm extremely comfortable in it and I'm I'm ready technically to become a little anxious become a little scared take a possible risk what uh, tell, okay so it sounds like you had a business and then did you end up closing it is that what happened yes over 12 years ago I've been doing my current profession for exactly uh, 10 years as of uh, two weeks ago okay can you can you talk a little bit about what happened in your other business? And and here are some of the things I'm I'm looking for. Is did it end up having to close because you were not good at sales, or were you in a market that was declining anyway? What what would you attribute attribute the closure to? Uh, Oversaturation in that uh, profession, uh, the marketing, the selling. I I don't unless it's something. You know, an ISTJ, myers Brig. if you Google it, you'll see selling is not one of the things. It's You're right. It's a scientist, attorney, accountant, detailed-oriented. Uh, now, an entrepreneur is in there, uh, but it's got to be something that's, you know, that's sellable, that people uh, really want. Um, and who, I, were your, I, who were your customers in that first business? Primarily um, people from the public, but that's not a good po portion of it. Uh, it was attorneys, um, and uh, trying to market to attorneys, I mean, if you've ever done that, is extremely tough unless you have something to give them, which I technically didn't. Um, I was in competition with other people as well that wanted the same exact thing, and everybody was the same, and it was really about networking. Mm, okay. And it's okay. tough to put exchange that for food and food in your stomach to survive. Very, very tough to do. But like I said, that was over 12 years ago. Um, and, you know, here's something that um, when I <laughs> listen to myself back on your YouTube um, channel is that, and this might resonate with someone listening, so hopefully it helps. I am motivated in the end by profit by anything. For example, I'm in the healthcare field, got a title, it's great. I would purchase a septic tank company. I would purchase a Porta John company. I would port a, purchase um, like one of your podcasts, the, the people that owned a metal rescrapping business. In the end, I am motivated by the profit end of things. It does not matter what it is. It's irrelevant. It could be the lowest form of life business, but if it's profiting, I'm making more money that I'm at my current job, I get excited and motivated by that. And just as a side note, I don't buy anything with it. I'm not buying crazy stuff. I'm not interested in things. I'm, I, I like investing and I, I want to snowball that. Mm. Well, I think it's pretty clear, you know, in your in your description of of your life and your lifestyle, uh, you know, a lot, most people we can probably agree that had an income 
over a hundred thousand would be buying, you know, the house, the cars, the boats, and all that kind of stuff. And they'd have all these finance charges and, and to, for someone to have a great income like that and not be tempted to get into that lifestyle consumption, you're certainly a person who's disciplined. Okay. Yeah. Um, the whole, the, the personality thing, I, uh, let me, let me suggest a couple things. Let me float a few balloons. Cause I'd like to get your feedback on them. Um, I am, I'm an INTJ, which, you know, we have three characteristics in common in our personalities. <clears throat> I have always been extremely good at sales, but only a certain kind, um, which is business to business sales, complex solutions. So here I am on the YouTube selling people educational programs on how to do something very complicated, which is buy or sell a business, right? And prior to that, I was a business broker where I actually bought, uh, helped people buy and sell business, the businesses themselves. And I've also had a career with, um, you know, a banking organization where I wasn't making car loans. I was, I was helping mid-sized companies with revolving credit products and how, and basically sold them on how it would impact their balance sheets. So when we start to talk about complicated things, you know, a, a great smile and a, and a few tactical selling techniques might help someone sell a used car. But if a company is going to invest in an expensive solution that's going to cost them time and money to implement, they have to be convinced that this is going to be a good thing, right? Okay. And so where I think you should be headed as far as a business, and, and we, we haven't tackled starting or buying yet, but, but let's talk about categories. Um, I think you need to be involved in something where the business sells something to other businesses because you'll be able to then talk to and make presentations to other smart people about how your gizmo, whatever it is, is going to in turn help them and make them more money or, or save them money or, or whatever the value proposition is. Um, the other neat thing about, about people who are um, introverted and thoughtful is that you can quickly understand somebody else's situation and empathize with them and, and, and figure out what their business model is. So when I was doing the finance solutions, one of the things I, I would ask a few questions when I got in there and started meeting with them, and I could determine very quickly if my solution probably didn't have any value for them at all. In which okay. case I would just, you know, say, well, here's what I do. Do you want to talk any more about it? And, and if they said yes, I would, but <clears throat> the, the whole idea was to disqualify them as quickly as possible so that I could move on to the more likely prospects. Right. Okay. So, so I think when we start to consider what kind of criteria of business, Jay, that you should be considering, we should be thinking about businesses that do business to business sales. So your customers will be other businesses and that your solution will be somewhat complex. It doesn't mean you're not going to have any competition. It just means that your sales are not going to be tactical. They're going to be probably involving meeting people, present, doing presentations, you know, doing uh, objection handling, showing people, and then, and then probably there will be some kind of implementation function too, where not only will you sell something to the customer, but you're then going to have to work with them to get it in place. Okay. How does that sound to you? That's, uh, again, you're you're very intuitive, and we have a lot of similarities. I, I don't I don't like uh, necessarily uh, selling to the public in general. Uh, you know, there's franchises; they're ready to go. One of the one locally was uh, Wingstop. You know, basically runs itself. The manager of a Wingstop that you hire gets a percentage on sales, and you basically just kind of roll in and collect checks. So uh, I understand, but it didn't appeal to me selling to people, you know, <laughs> people suck uh, in that <laughs> kind of industry. People suck. So this is very appealing. And I, we are both introverted. However, 
like for on this call, I'm very extroverted. I'm very good at putting on a temporary show and mm-hmm. selling when now you said a good word to more intelligent people, especially when you start tacking on all the letters behind my name. They go, wow, okay, this is an educated guy. He's motivated. He's enthusiastic. And see, that, that excites me as opposed to, you know, middle class or perhaps lower in a food industry or, you know, a copy shop. Um, but I'm open to anything that as long as it can kind of be somewhat passive mm. eventually. Now, that's the main goal, um, starting something that's not super active, except possibly in the beginning, but eventually becomes passive. And I, I hire and I'm the owner. I'm not the manager. I, you know, you said a good good book uh, on your last podcast with uh, Jesse, the dentist, I believe, is um, Gerber, the E-Myth, which I've read twice mm. in my life. And that's that, that book that book opened up uh, quite a quite a bit for me, and I still remember it. Well, you see, here's the here's the dark side then to the coin, is because you're talking about um, being more passive, letting other people do their jobs, and I'm not familiar in particular with the wing stop, but you know I can imagine what it must be like, and I've seen many fast food restaurants, and so one of the reasons why. Um, you know, Ray Kroc was able to do what he did with McDonald's is because the different steps in that business are, are relatively simple, right? Cooking Uh hamburgers, wrapping them up, serving the customers. You know, when I was a teenager, I worked at a movie theater. They taught me in, in a day how to work behind the county, the candy counter, right? Selling popcorn and pop to people as they, as they came up. And so the, the actions involved in making the business work are relatively simple. And so you can systemize it to a great deal, to, to a great extent, and that's what creates the opportunity for the passivity. Now, if we're going to talk about those food franchises, you know, there's a lot of cases where an individual owner owns one location and they spend time there being the manager. I know a guy who owns, uh, you know, three locations of a fast food restaurant. He still spends time behind a desk every day. He's not in the locations, but he's looking at the numbers. He's analyzing what's going on. And he's learned that he can't keep the eye, his eye off the businesses. He can't, he can't walk away entirely because he's managing at a different level, looking for different things. You know, in, in, his, in particular, he's looking for signs that people might be stealing, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. There's okay. a lot of cash that goes through the business. So when you get into a more complicated business with more complicated products, it's more difficult to systematize. You have to rely on having, you know, superhero type employees. So, and that was the case when I was with, uh, with the bank is they had a really difficult time in systematizing a sales function where you're calling on companies that do a hundred million in sales. And so they had to look for exceptional people that would be able to do that for them, right? And so to get to that level, though, where you're able to hire those kinds of people consistently, um, a very small business is going to have a hard time doing that, which means that initially, or if it's a smaller size business, and, and by small, I mean, you know, something doing under two to five million in sales, then it's probably going to require a lot of your time and a lot of your oversight. Uh, I'm reminded of this guy I knew. Actually, I knew his wife in university. She was in a, in a class of mine. And they had uh, come over from Austria. And the fella was working for a company that built paper-making machines. And a, a paper-making machine is the size of a four-story apartment building. And they cost, <laughs> they cost like $100 million, right? And this company in Austria built these machines and he came over to Canada and his job was to sell one of these machines that like, that was his quota one in Canada. Right. And, um, he managed to sell one and in the sale, he wrote himself in for three years. Mm. So once the machine was installed, he was going to stay there for three years to make sure that it ran properly. Right. And, okay. and so that's an example of an, ex, an extreme example 
of a complicated sales process. So, you know, there's probably a middle ground. Um, but when you start to think about these kinds of criteria, you start to make a list. You say, number one, I'm looking for a business that sells to other businesses. Number two, I'm looking for a product that is maybe a complex solution, right? Okay. As far as starting something, a brand new business, you're in a position where that's that's something that I, I wouldn't tell you not to do. Most people I say don't start a business because it's too risky. It's you don't know when you're going to get cash flow positive, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're going to hang on to your job, then you don't need a cash flow from the business right away. And you can afford to put some money into the business to get it going. Right. Okay. And so a complex solution that requires, you know, a lot of sales effort may be coming from some new innovation or new technology. And so it, it, it the business that you might want to consider would be something trying to exploit or commercialize some new thing that is going to be useful to other businesses. And okay. it's, it's funny. I have a, <clears throat> I have a neighbor that lives around the corner from me. Do you know what a kingpin is? Yeah. On, on the whole, they own the whole block. What's that? They own the whole block A kingpin. <laughs> oh no, I'm not. I'm not talking about it in the in the in in the, in that sense. Uh, a kingpin is on a on a tractor trailer trailer. <laughs> uh, it's the big it's the big pin that sticks down that pokes into the into the truck, and so the truck basically pulls on the kingpin, and all the weight of the trailer is on that pin. Okay, and it's a big thick metal thing, right? It's very strong. And it has a certain life expectancy to it. And these guys invented a way to hard chrome them without taking them off the trailer. So they have this apparatus they built. So they, they visit these trucking companies and they, they put the, uh, this machine up on the pin and it hard chromes them. And it basically gets a couple more years of life out of it without replacing it. And it greatly extends the life of the trailer. Okay. Hmm. So the different departments of transportation in the different states and provinces, they have rules about how old a kingpin can get before it has to be replaced. And so before these guys could actually go and make a sale to any trucking company, they had to go and sell themselves to these departments of transportation. And hmm. they had to demonstrate that their technique was solid and that their, the, the result was safe. And that they could, re they really could extend the life of these trailer kingpins. Okay. And so this is the kind of thing that I'm imagining for you. Hmm. So there was the invention and then there was the effort put into the commercialization, which meant going and talking to the departments of transportation. Probably they had to pay some guys to do a study. Right. Okay. And then only after all of that, they actually go and make sales to trucking companies where they show them the savings and extending the life of the trailers. Now that they've done all that, they've got a sweet business, mm. right? Because of course they've got patents on all these things and all these um, rules and regulations and, and, and intellectual property protections that prevent every other company from jumping into the space. Mm. And, mm. Creating a business like that is not something I would recommend to most people because most people need to buy a business because they need an income and they've got to be making money from day one. Mm. And, and what makes your, you, your situation so unique is that you could actually pull something like this off. Hmm. And, and I, like I said, I have um, a good full-time work and I have plenty of time. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with bankers or banking, but with a perfect credit score and if I could get six figures in cash, um, and, and get more cash uh, from my stepfather, um, I have a lot but of options. Is, you know, creating a business from scratch, you're not going to be borrowing. Like, I mean, any borrowing you do is going to be just on your personal credit score. It'll just be right. personal debt. Um, but I mean, this is still risky to start something. 
Um, mm. But if you create that kind of sketch of that sort of business in your head, you can also go looking for a business like that and it'll, it'll help give you more clarity in something that you want to buy that's already operating. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm. The other business you used to have when you were trying to sell to lawyers, uh, was that something you started? Yes. Um, straight out from school, that's how it works. You don't, you don't really work for anybody. Um, mm -hmm. To succeed, you have to basically uh, sell yourself. And uh, the best way in that field was um, via attorneys. And so it's very, very tough, extremely tough and very stressful. And uh, you don't have a value proposition uh, coming out of school, and the failure rate is very high. Um, and uh, I'm not even interested in owning that um, as being strictly an owner and hiring people out of school for very low pay. Um, in the end, it would still be me with uh, networking with attorneys, which um, I don't mm -hmm. particularly want to do. It's not very exciting, rewarding, and in the end, um, unless you have some type of niche, so you have, you know somebody, um, again, it's very tough. So, so the attorneys themselves weren't the customers. You, you were trying to um, market through them, sort of influencer marketing. Right, getting their clients. Um, you know, the people come to them for accidents, and then I mm -hmm. would, I would have uh, treated treated them and uh, okay. making your reports, things of that nature, and then they get a settlement, and then I basically got my bill paid. Um, oh, a after the money flowed. You got it. You got it, and a little wow. bit through insurance, and a little bit through insurance. Um, but you have to do a fair amount of volume, and with the amount of people in that field, it uh, was extremely saturated. Yeah. Well, and I can just imagine the cash flow. I mean, my own cash flow scenario from being a business broker was was awful enough. I've made enough videos where I mentioned that. Yeah. To, to have to wait until the settlements were complete. Um. I mean, that would be stressful. Oh yeah. Six months to up to three years. It, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want to, you don't want to live, live like that. That's for sure. So, so maybe something we can add to our list. Uh, and this would be something that I would certainly share is that we're not looking for any kind of business that, that relies on a contingency payment model. Correct. That's, a, that's, that's fair enough. Yes. All right. So, and, and, and so this is the kind of introspection you do when you're trying to think about what you'd be happy with and what you wouldn't be happy with. I was on a call the other day with someone who, who earns money on contingency and they're perfectly happy and, and, and they're fine with that. But I've gone through that phase of my life. <laughs> right. And you like know, you if I too. did, <laughs> yeah, if I did something like that, I would still have my full-time job and, and until the point that I would at least match my current income, at that point I could say, hey, you know, you, and you know this, you would have enough momentum and you have enough contacts where you say, okay, I'm generating my my job income and now I, technically I could still do that part time or just throw all your eggs in and say, let's really get this thing going. Well, well, wait a second though. If you're talking about a business where it just takes you a while to get paid, that's just, that's different from a contingency payment model. So I'll give you an example. I know guys who do uh, flood and fire restoration. So somebody has a fire in their home and the firemen come and they put it out and then the adjuster arrives and right. um, figures out that they can, they can uh, save the house, right? And so then the, the restoration fellows arrive and they got to tear out the carpet and they got to, you know, tear out insulation and fix everything. And, and it's a long drawn out process. And then when they're done, the homeowner signs off and that satisfies the insurance company, but the insurance company takes them like 60 to 75 days to pay them. Mm. So the, the thing they hate about their industry is that from the day they start, it could take them, you know, sometimes 30, 40 days to fix up the damage. And then they wait another 75 to get paid. So they have a huge amount of capital tied up in receivables from insurance companies and every single one of those bills will be paid. Mm. So they're not worried about not getting paid. 
but they have to always have a lot of, of a lot of money tied up in waiting to be paid. Right. Well, when I say a contingency model, it would be what happens if, you know, to use your example about treating the accident victims, what happens if they don't win their case? That happened. Yeah. And well, the attorneys would come back to me and say, Hey, we didn't get anything, you know? And I say, okay, I'm with you. We, we took a gamble and we lost. Right. And so that's a contingency model where gotcha. you're waiting for some other event you don't control. And that, and that, and that exactly. was the case with me, like the commissions and the business brokerage, because I could have a great business, a buyer and a seller. And, a, you know, uh, in one case, a deal went south because it was a regulated business and the buyer um, couldn't get a license from a government agency. Correct. On one of your last podcasts, you mentioned um, how you had six businesses ready to sell yeah. for a quarter million. And after all of that was said and done, you got way less than half of that. And it was enough to punch you out of that. Yeah. I completely relate to that. Yeah. And 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 that's what really turned me off that the whole industry of business brokerage was just all these other people had the ability to upset the apple cart and so that's why when i when i created this new business i do today it's it's much more traditional in that i've got customers and i offer them something either service or product like one of my online courses and they pay me for it very simple right, right. and one of the things that that uh, I always have to be conscious of is if I try, I start in my head trying to make things too complex, because I'll get excited by things that are different and new, and I have to remind myself <laughs> sometimes, you know, keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> and you, another good word you said was analysis paralysis. That's what us introverts, uh, I N I S people, um, can get caught up in. And what everything that can go wrong, which I do very well and very little about what can do go right. And those can, that's from what you just told me about contingencies. Yes. You're thinking about everything that could go wrong. And then um, you have to put food on the table in the meantime. So uh, mm. that's, um, that's, that's very eye opening for me. Skepticism, I think is a good thing. Um, on Saturday, just a few days ago, um, I was attending this event in Toronto and it was um, an event for new entrepreneurs in their, from startup to their third year. And one lady gave a talk and she was talking about the eternal optimism of entrepreneurs and how they'll, they'll cling to that one last ember, believing mm -hmm. that it, you know, it will always flare up into a, a roaring fire. And what, Unfortunately, I've come to learn after all the years I've been working with business owners and from what I've seen working at the bank and what I've seen in my business brokerage is that business is risky. There's a lot of failure. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I'm on the bandwagon of buying a business instead of starting one, right? At least if you've got the customers there and you you know what they want and you have the employees that know how to serve them. Um, it's more likely you're going to have success, right? And and so it's the skepticism is a powerful tool. Um, one of the things I talk about in one of my courses is uh, is buyer fever. It's actually a term that that uh, uh, was used by a guy named Ted Leverett, who's got this program as well for buying businesses. And where people get so excited uh, about the prospect of what it's going to be like to be a business owner that they start to gloss over or ignore obvious warning signs that things are not right. And um, I'll give you a great example of a, of a case of buyer fever. There was a, a beauty salon that I was asked to consult on and a lady bought, worked in the beauty salon and then she was going to buy it. And it was a place where they did haircuts. They did hair styling on one side and they had aesthetic services like waxing and, and stuff like that on the other side. And um, she was given a set of financial statements and the business was shown to do a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in sales. And she made her decision to buy based on that. And a few mm -hmm. days before closing, she decided to run a report from their POS system just to show what the last 12 months sales were. 
And it was like 30 to 40% lower than what the financial statements said. Mm. And the conversation happened, the conversation, my conversation with her happened after she bought it. Okay. Mm. And she, so she's telling me this and I said, well, if you saw that the sales had fallen that much, why did you complete the deal? Why wouldn't you have backed out? Why wouldn't you have stopped? Because clearly the price you were paying was all based on what you had been shown and et cetera. And, and she just said, well, I had no idea where I would go to work and I was mm. just so excited about the business and I had all these changes planned and I was going to redecorate and I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And, and the reason I was having the conversation with her is because I ran into her in a department store where she was working. Mm. And I said, I said, weren't you the person that, that bought that business? And, and so that's the kind of thing that happens. People get caught up in the excitement of the idea of what it's going to be like to be the owner. And maybe they're dreaming about the lifestyle or maybe they're dreaming about uh, esteem that they might gain from people in their community for being the owner of the business or, or whatever it is. The skepticism is important. Um, you know, right now on a, on a personal note, I'm, I'm doing a renovation in the basement of my house. And I've got a guy, he's building me a bathroom and he's going to put new flooring and stuff like this. And my girlfriend is saying, let's redo the kitchen too. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm saying, well, you know, <clears throat> the bathroom is only a $7,000 project. The kitchen could be a $30,000 project. And she's like, yeah, but that's fine. Everything is good. Everything is good. And, and so, but the first thing that popped into my mind is what happens if YouTube changes its algorithm and my customer pipeline dries up? Because even though my business is successful and I help people and people listen to me and all this kind of thing, I know that there are weaknesses in what I do. And the fact that I get so many people coming from a place like YouTube makes me um, reliant on that platform. Right. And I don't control that platform. And so I think I was able to buy myself 18 months to two years on the, on the kitchen reno. Um, <laughs> but right. I, it idea. won't be so scary. Maybe if I can save up the money. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That's kind of um, where I had, I had, I had such a bad experience with that previous profession and business since I'm anonymous and uh, I can say it, it, it is straight up fear. Mm. One word, fear. And that's why I think it's wise to, first of all, find something, a business, run, run it by someone like yourself. Is this practical? Is this reasonable? And then let you look over the numbers because it's, it becomes, in my opinion, until you get experience, it becomes too emotional. And that's what it would be mm -hmm. with me. It would, I would be running on my emotion rather than logic, and y you would be the logic part of it. Uh, but l getting ideas is the, the first thing and the places to look. Um, like I said, I, I could do anything. Um, it's just finding the people that are selling and then, hey, this is what it is and this is what I'm selling. And I think it would be wise for someone like you to run through the numbers and discuss mm -hmm. it. I think it's, I don't think it's a cost out of your customers and people like myself, potential clients' pockets. It's an, an investment. It's not a cost. I, I position, like when I work with buyers, I, I position it as insurance. Good word. Right. Because if you're going to, if you're going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a business, does it, you know, it makes sense to spend a couple grand for somebody to look over your shoulder. Right. And, and so, you know, that, that's the way I think of it. And, you know, my mission is to, is to help prevent people from doing bad deals. Like, like the lady with the, the beauty salon. Right. I, that, that was terrible. She, she lost a bunch of money that probably took, probably took her and her husband 20 years to save up, you know? I, and, I relate. I, I completely and totally relate enough to get out of it and do something else hmm. um, on, on my end. But yeah, that's the whole thing. And what else can I do? What would, uh, what would be an okay fit? 
but uh, you, profit is my motivation. And then um, what what could I start? What could I buy? You know, really just idea. You could just start saying, hey, this business, this is this, this business. Here's a website that you can check out. They're selling it. Get the financials. Send it back to you. You check it out. Um, I, I know it's a it's kind of a strange call, um, but I don't have a starting place. I, it's I can do anything. It just doesn't matter to me. Well, you can do anything. Are you able to move? As long, yes. As long as it's in the state of Florida, I'm a I'm okay. a Florida. Florida boy, born and raised. In fact, for uh, many of your listeners, I've um, I've never seen snow. And in fact, <laughs> it, this is going to be the coldest night of the year as we speak. They say it's going to get down to 40, 39 degrees, and uh, that's pretty that's pretty unreasonable. Um, I'll turn my heater on. Um, so yeah, my family lives here. Uh, I'm not willing to move out of the state. Are, is there something to do with your work that is license related to that would keep you in the state? No, it's um, no, no. Free as a bird to go to any other state. Um, it's, as long as it's in the southern U.S., I could take a chance for um, a small amount of time. But um, that that seems like purchasing a business that would generate me a couple hundred thousand right out of the hole. And for something to generate that kind of profit in my pocket that you're talking, I don't know, it sounds like a, maybe a couple million dollar business to generate the type of profits that would um, allow me to quit my job immediately and uh, immediately roll into something else. See, that kind of sounds fun, but it's terrifying. And the same mm -hmm. word is fear. Yeah, but if it's if it's a good reliable business and the numbers work and it's a fair deal and there's um, you know each side takes gives something away in the negotiations that I would I would almost be open to that. Well, you know it's it's interesting because in um, in the purchase of a business, the the biggest problem on both sides of the table is compulsion or extreme motivation, you might say. Um, people don't normally want to sell a good business. Um, it often makes more sense to keep the business because of the cash flow. And, mm -hmm. and smaller businesses sell for very low multiples of their earnings, right? Not, you know, public companies traditionally have traded for, you know, 9 to 15 times next year's forecast earnings now with the way the stock market is and all the extra money out there that they get way higher than that. But that's been the tradition and small businesses can sell for one and a half to three, you know, 3.5 times cash flow. Then when I talk with sellers and they say to me, you know, I want to sell my business. And I say, look, based on your industry, your business is worth 2.2 times, you know, it's cash flow. They say, well, if I just stayed here for the next two years, I'd get the same money, mm -hmm. right? So who would do that? Well, it's, it's somebody who has to. Illness, right. divorce, poor health, boredom, need to relocate, right? And, and then you I'll said another good word. You said another good word in one of your podcasts, trust but verify. And you mm -hmm. can just say it as it is. You have to assume that person, at least I do, across the table is lying about every detail and you have to get the truth in it. Why are you really selling it? At least, um, you know, it's kind of a, like you said, a, it's maybe a grim outlook, but I like uh, trust and verify. That's a positive way of saying you are lying and you need to prove to me. And then I need to confirm everything. Well, you know, in a good deal, in a good negotiation, you're going to get to know that other party and, and mm. they're going to get to know you and, and you have to learn, to trust each other. And, and the way that you protect yourself is through the structure of the deal. Right. So, so they don't get all the money on closing. There's some kind of seller financing and that's what creates an important motivation on their part to make sure that you do well because they want the balance of their money. Right. That, right. That's a good, I'd like your, um, your little talk about that on one of your podcasts regarding um, the deal structure and they, they give up something and um, I give up something and they, they're accountable for something. Um, I, that's appealing. 
Yeah. The, the other side of the table with compulsion is with the buyers. So, you know, a, a buy, and, and, and this is where you are going to have to have patience if you go to buy a business because you're in a unique position where you're free to walk away from any table, right? You, you mm-hmm. have a good income. You, your hours are great. You don't need to buy a business, but there are other people who do. So people who just lost their six figure income and their savings go down every month, that person will probably outbid you for a good business. Mm right? Uh, The newly arrived people, newcomers to the country who are coming from a place where they have funds, but they need to start creating an income for themselves, you know? And and this is why a lot of, uh, you know, businesses like convenience stores, gas stations, dry cleaners, et cetera, get get purchased by newcomers to the country because um, they can, they can run them even with a language barrier, right? And, and so they're willing to pay more for, for say a dry cleaning business than you would. And, right. and they're going to earn more by displacing all the employees and working 70 hours a week. Right. Oh, it's, correct. You're, you're never going to do that. Correct. So, so patience is going to be something that you'll have to apply if you decide to buy a business, because you'll have to find the right opportunity and you might have the disappointment of, of other people who have greater compulsion uh, being willing to do more. And right. so, so that can be something that, uh, that might be a problem for you. And you know what, David, even though, um, it, it might not even work out at all, which I'm prepared for. Maybe like I, I mentioned, the, the whole reason for the call is to get ideas and maybe there aren't any ideas. Maybe, I've just got it too good and I can't find anything and maybe lightning will strike. Um, I don't know. And I can't actively find anything or I continue to do what I do for the next 20 years. And that's it. You know, you know, I'm just, I'm just exploring. That's kind of the fun thing. Um, what, what, where I'm at, but, um, I know well, we've got about 10 how, minutes left. What, what ideas do you, what ideas? I, I, I don't know if I provide enough info to get anything specific. Uh, I've got business to business for complex solutions, something mm-hmm. possibly new, uh, invent something. Um, do you have any, do you have any specifics? Um, anything well, I can look at? I was going to suggest that if, if you're looking for a way to invest money and it's kind of getting into a business, you, you might just want to, and, and think of it as a spectrum, uh, very okay. active business is a business you're working in all the time and a, and a completely passive investment would be, uh, giving a banker some money for a CD, right? You, you right. just hand over the money and then you do nothing. They just give you your interest. Okay. And if you, if you think of it, along the spectrum of the amount of work that you have to do for the returns, what you'll find is that there's certain things that start to move inward from the passive side. So traditionally something like owning a building, right? You got it. Apartment complexes. Exactly. I've been very focused on real estate. Yes. So, so it's, it's a place where you can be active in running that business, but the time demand isn't there all the time. And you can take advantage of your income and your good credit score, maybe to to obtain additional leverage because you can borrow against buildings, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or something like mini storage, perhaps, right? And so, okay. it's it, there's probably you could probably get a few million dollars worth of those income properties and still have your job. Okay. Hmm. And so that's something that, that you might want to explore. The, As opposed to actually buying a, buying a business. That, sound, that kind of sounds more appealing. Uh, you know, I always think of my current job, what happens if it, it goes away and I have to move or, I, you know, I don't, I don't really want to start over. So that's kind of uh, another hmm. reason why I'm looking for something that I can stay local. But um it's flexibility is what I own. Uh, it's extreme flexibility. I can leave where I'm at today. 
with nothing, barely anything to move. So that I'm going, this is a rare opportunity. If another man in my position would kill to have this. So, yeah, you know, maybe buying a business might not even be appropriate for me. Um, maybe something more passive. Um, again, I, it's, that's, that's all I'm doing is exploring. Yeah. And, the, I mean, the thing about real estate is that the price moves are inverse with the interest rate moves. And now that we're starting to see interest rates creep up slowly, um, the prices may start to move in the other direction a little bit. The, my my fear about real estate is that is that uh, it's big, immovable, and you know if there's ever a problem with the government, what they do is they raise taxes, and you can't hide a building. <laughs> <laughs> right. I agree. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, all of a sudden taxes start to go up, etc. Um, you know, at one time I owned three apartment buildings. And as the interest rates kept going down, 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 and I saw what kind of prices people were willing to pay, I realized I had to get out of it Mm. because I I said, you know what? I could never buy the building at that price and make any money with it. I don't see how these guys can. So the obvious choice is to, is to offer supply into the market. Mm. Right. But we may be at the point where that's starting to change. Hmm. And of course, every market's different. So you'd have to examine, you know, your communities locally there. Um, right. I think that if you're in central Florida, there could be some neat opportunities for, you know, people are taking properties and they're using them in different ways, you know, like the whole Airbnb thing. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a way to get a better return. And maybe with your workload, uh, taking care of some Airbnb properties where you may have to go out and check them every day after the cleaners have been there or something. Maybe that's something that's feasible for you. Hmm. That sounds uh, appealing. Um, seems to be real flexible. Hmm. Again, um, I, what, what ideas would you have? Like, for example, mind mapping, what ideas to, for me to get a list together? And there's a couple of um, business for sales sites, do you have any other um, references that I can spend time, spend 15, 20 hours jotting ideas down? Do you what, have any? Here, here's an exercise that I suggest to people is, okay, we've, we've already started a list of criteria. We have a couple of items on the list, okay? Start to think about the different characteristics of a business, and I, I recommend you go someplace where there are different businesses. So an industrial park or an office park okay. or something uh, okay. in your car. Because, because you want stimulus that's going to take you outside your normal thought patterns. So you, you drive along in an industrial park and you look at the different businesses and, and think about who their customers are. And here are, here are the kinds of things you're going to want to think about. Are they, you know, homeowners or are they normal consumers or other businesses? And would this business have very few customers that spend a lot of money or a lot of customers that spend a little bit of money? Is this business serving people locally or is this person, is this business serving people nationally, internationally or regionally? Right. Okay. And and you, you start to create these, these criteria and, and, and some of these things you're going to prefer and some of them you're not going to care much for. But when you start to think about this stuff, you can start to have some preferences. So you might say, I'm interested in a business that sells to other businesses that has a lot of customers that spend relatively small amount of money. And so a B2B business that could be customers that spend five grand a year. So it's, it's not, okay. not like a donut shop, but you know, it's still a relatively small amount for maybe a business that does a million dollars a year, right? In sales. So you start to create these criteria and it's almost like a shopping list of criteria and then go somewhere where you can get your hands on uh, a beautiful, beautiful gem of a document. It's called the yellow pages. <laughs> Do you have one of these still? Yes. Okay. And then what you're going to want to do is open it up in the very start and where it's going to say abattoir probably will be the first thing. And just look at your list and say, would an abattoir 
satisfy these items. And gotcha. then you go to the next one, which would be accounting, you know, different accounting professionals. And you say, would an accounting firm satisfy this list? And, and what you're going to find, Jay, is you're going to find business types that you never dreamed of. And you're going to say, hey, wait a minute. This industrial rubber gasket company could be just the kind of thing I would want to own. Right. Even though right now you may never dream up, you know, an industrial rubber, rubber gasket distributor. Right, right. Right. I like that idea. You know, I know we've got a couple minutes left is finding criteria, then processing that through. And over all of this, under the umbrella of imagination, that mm -hmm. seems to be imagine something. So I think even listeners, when even when I'm listening to this back, because I'm going to, is I I wanted uh, you to be a magic genie and say this is the business you need to get into and this is how we do it and that's that's not reality and I I know that it's what I wanted to hear I wanted to hear one business and that's it but I'm it's going to be like all all of us it's going to be on us to find something I'm going to have to use my imagination and the criteria you just gave me that seems to be a good start and I'm going to have to put time and effort into this and which I can that, that's that's the beauty of, of what I do I, I have the time and um the resources and uh, can do this so and to tie it back to the hamburgers and McDonald's um the reason why they all taste the same of course is because they've got that process and the way that you you find a business that's right for you is by is by developing a process. Gotcha. And it's it's not always the same process for everybody, but if you think about it like that, if you're cognizant of the fact that you are trying to create a process to lead you to certain results, then you're going to be able to apply that same process over and over and over again. And we mentioned you know rental properties and real estate. Uh, a lot of the people that are, you know, out there teaching people about how to invest in real estate, for example, one of the biggest key components to almost all those programs is here is the process for finding um, the right property that's going to do X, Y, and Z for you, right? Right. And so it's 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 about process all the time. Great. Great. That's, um, you know, I normally you would probably be the one that cuts the time off, but that's exactly an hour. Um, and I'm very, very happy with I'm very happy with the call. I'm very excited. Um, it's reality. Um, you're not a genie, uh, but you gave me good ideas and it's going to be on me. And then when I if I find a business not consulting you would um, would be insane. It, it'd be a bad idea. And it, um if and when I do, um, you're obviously it. Well, thank you, thank you, Jay. Um, I'll uh, I'll put your name in my in my lead pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds great. Awesome. And I, and uh, us Floridians will, yeah, us Floridians will be staying um, will be staying warm tonight. And um, if it uh, dusting of snow happens, it'll be my first time seeing snow. So I doubt that'll happen, but it'll get close. Well. Keep the oranges safe for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good night, man. All right. Take care, David.